Let's uh, let's get this thing rolling, rocking and rolling. Rocking and rolling, rolling and rocking. All right, I'll stop. That's, that's scaring me. This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Cyber Frontiers, show number twenty-two, recorded on June first, twenty fifteen. Here on Cyber Frontiers, we explore cybersecurity, big data, and the technologies that are shaping the future, all from an academic perspective. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the Average Guys TV studios here in a beautiful Bellevue, Bellevue, Nebraska. Man, we got out and played some Ultimate Frisbee tonight, and it was awesome. And, of course, we post the show with world-class show notes each week out at TheAverageGuy.tv. If you have questions, comments, or contributions, of course, you can contact us, send us an email. That's just Jim at TheAverageGuy.tv. You can track me down on Twitter at Jay Collison. And you can even call in those questions, 402-478-8450. Not sure why I give that number. Nobody ever does. But if you do, we'll consider those questions for the show as well. And Cyber Frontiers is a part of the Geeks Network. You can find this show and many other great podcasts out at thegeeksnetwork.com. And don't forget, TheAverageGuy.tv is powered by Maple Grove Partners Web Hosting. It's secure, reliable, high-speed hosting. Christian, I'm going to be honest. When I read this copy and you're on the show, it feels odd. I'm, I'm sorry. Just it's just weird. But that's I'm Christian. Really sorry. Maple Grove Partners is Christian. Christian, you got a couple spots open, right, on Maple Grove Partners for folks yes. that might want to join us? Yeah, for sure. And, and uh, plans we're, for 10 bucks. Yeah. And we're, we're rapidly uh, working to get more into our uh, podcast community as well and supporting yeah. people who are doing some niche podcast networking. So it's pretty cool. So if you're looking to do something good and you want to get on the, you know, you want to kind of create your own web space and you want to do it with people that you trust, maplegrovepartners.com. It's really just Christian. And uh, we'd love to have you over there as well. And uh, we are back. Wow. We set a record for Cyber Frontiers. Uh, we, we've done two in a week. Uh, last Monday we were doing this and we got to the end of the show and we said, hey, we really need to make this a three-part series. And so if this is the first one you've caught, you want to go back to 20. We've got 20. Uh, 21 and 22, it's a three-part series as we're talking about big data cybersecurity in the enterprise. And so, again, if this is the first one, you want to head back to 20. They are required and a prerequisite to get this far. Not really. You can listen from here on out if, you, <laughs> if you'd like to, but we'd love to have you do that as well. Uh, joining me, and I'll go left to right, all the way from his dorm room in, uh, in sunny Omaha, not too far from me, Ashton. Uh, I can't say welcome to Omaha because you've been here a week now, but it's good to have you here. Uh, welcome. Yeah, it's good to be here. Um Looking forward to another great podcast. Yeah, settling in in the uh, the fine uh, the fine office, the river facing office that you have there at uh, at uh, the Gallup Riverfront campus. So pre pretty good gig, I would think. Yeah, the view is pretty awesome. Definitely the best I've I've ever had from uh, any dorm I've, or any sorry any uh, office I've ever been in. So yeah, no, that's great. Sure you're right on the river, literally. And then coming in, I think Columbia, right? Columbia, and uh, is Christian Johnson. Christian, welcome. I'm doing well. Um, thanks for being here. Or thank. Wow. <laughs> Christian's a little loopy <laughs> tonight. Uh, he has been burning the midnight oil at Maple Grove Partners, as well as at Northrop Grumman, as well as at Gallup. And so, Christian, well, maybe we'll give you a mulligan. Yeah, let me let me just take a fresh take two on that. Um, <laughs> thank you for welcoming me welcoming me to the show. Um, we'll see how far I can get through tonight. Apparently, not far. Um, but good to be here and uh, enjoying my summer so far. Although it's early in the process, it goes pretty quick. So it goes super fast. Cherish every hour you get. Yeah, 12 weeks goes like that. So we'll be done. And then uh, my partner in crime over there, the, our male model for the Average Guy Network, Kevin Spoonover. Kevin, how are you? Well, once again, this doesn't just happen. This takes a lot of input and a lot of time. <clears throat> I'm good. I'm good. I, I seem to have lost my voice last week, but it's coming back. And uh, even though I think every – this is the first Monday in probably seven weeks I haven't had a plane ticket in my hand, so I'm kind of not knowing really what to do with myself other than well, the podcast. So. Yeah, we're glad that it worked out. We could get this series wrapped up. It's taken us a month and a half to kind of get all three parts in and. You know, I, I, let me just say, I appreciate the audience, you who's listening to this right now, that you are very, I've never had anybody complain. And so thank you for not, you know, because we, our schedule is not the most regular. But uh, if you're listening to this, I want to say thanks for listening to it. What, we love what we do here. 
you guys have never complained about it, and so I appreciate that. Let's dig in a little bit tonight. Christian, we've got kind of part three on this. We've been working off a doc that we thought would maybe take one, and then we stretched into two, and then now we're getting to three. Um, uh, but where are we going tonight? What do we want to do to kind of wrap this up? Yeah, so we really, we've really we been talking a lot about infrastructure. We talked a lot about data, um, but one of the big areas that we didn't get a chance to kind of clamp down on in a serious way was cloud infrastructure. And a lot of the stuff that we've talked about is supported on the cloud or it operates around the cloud or it's enhanced the way clouds themselves are designed and operated, but we kind of danced around the bush without talking about the bush. So we figured we might as well come to the, the part three and look at what are some of the common ways clouds are being implemented, what are the open source technologies in the field that are growing, um, and where are the where are the kind of hot buttons for the enterprise when we talk about implementing clouds in small, medium, large, but really the enterprise where um, you know there's several really prominent and well-supported communities for uh, cloud infrastructure in the enterprise, and um, everyone kind of has their own niche as to what they like and why. Um, so we kind of want to just focus in on that a little bit and um, have a conversation around it. All right. So where do, where, where do we want to get started? So I, I think uh, Kevin... Kevin brought up a really um, kind of great focus point, and I think it's kind of where the birth of open source cloud really took off um, in a meaningful way, and that is with OpenStack. And I've had a lot of good experiences with OpenStack. I've had a lot of bad experiences with OpenStack. Um, it really, um, regardless of whether or not you love or hate the software, the one thing that is hard to argue is that it definitely has a pretty big grassroots IT movement. Um, and so... It's really, uh, at least for me, has been more of a research tool than it has been a production use, but there are companies that use this in production. It really has evolved a lot. Um, there's over there's developers in over 180 countries, and they have at least, I think, 20,000, 20, give or take, active developers in the community, active developers, not even users. Um, and so it's it's grown to be a huge infrastructure um, one of the most notable things about it, in my opinion, is that the entire infrastructure is written in Python, more or less, which is uh, kind of bizarre when we think that, you know, eh, well, some people might get upset when I say Python is a scripting language, but um, true confessions, Python is a scripting language in most common conventional use cases. Um, some might want to argue that, and there's other forms to argue that. But, you know, Python is really, uh, in, in this case, acting as a full object-oriented and or low-level program uh, programming language, and it implemented the entire infrastructure. So um, it's really interesting to see how that language is used. Um, and, and it really isn't related to the conversation of you know, talking about the cloud technologies, but I always like to bring it up when we talk about things like OpenStack because it's such a weird anomaly. It's very rare that you see something this expansive with this many developers be all in Python and be pertaining to infrastructure. It's just a very, very unique um, combination. Of course, I, I make some arguments for why Python is probably not the best design choice from a, uh, an overarching um, viewpoint, primarily when you talk about performance and, and usability, but you know, they've really managed to make that environment work so far, and so I, I give that to their credit that um, the developer community really backs uh, that decision. Um, Kevin, have you seen in your environments or in the community at large um, folks who are interested or devoting a certain amount of their time at work to extending the OpenStack platform with their own development, or are they more or less using what they get out of the box with the latest release? A little bit of both, you know, the, um, um, you know, so from my position in the marketplace as a distributor who represents vendors, the the unique thing we see with OpenStack is, you know, you think about uh, what's been popular over the last five years, and in most cases it's technology that a vendor kind of listens to end users and then comes back and says, here's the magic thing. You know, uh, a few years ago it was centralized storage arrays. And then it was, you know, this is great to centralize. You can do snapshots, point-in-time copies. 
um, and, and then we you know we've rolled into different technologies. The interesting thing with OpenStack is it is one of the first things I've seen in a while that end users have embraced themselves and have really you know sounded out to so you know for people listening to this go to Google or your favorite search engine and type in OpenStack and hit enter and what the first few things you'll get is HP OpenStack, Cisco OpenStack, you know, it, and it's a vendor's name with OpenStack. The OpenStack community, their concern is, I don't want EMC OpenStack. I want Open OpenStack. I want it the way it's written and the way it's done. So back to your question, I think mostly what we're seeing today is a lot of test cases. A lot of folks are embracing OpenStack. Um, for their lab environments to get a better feel for it, to get some function for it, um, you know, from and, and that's kind of from a private cloud, an internal cloud point of view. Most of them, if you ask them the outright question of, you know, in two to three years, do you see yourself moving to OpenStack? The majority of them are saying yes. Um, <clears throat> And then, you know, the, the place we're seeing OpenStack really kind of take off is with some of the public cloud providers. So guys like Rackspace are jumping into OpenStack rather quickly. Um, HP has had their big push with OpenStack. So, you know, it is one of these things that it's refreshing and it's surprising to see them uh, embrace this uh, and not have vendors pushing it down on them. Um, what, but I, I have a question and a comment back to your Python question, um, and yes, it is a scripting language. Uh, you, I, I think in a lot of ways, and, and this is my assumption, but when I think about what OpenStack does of managing and controlling and getting all these things to talk to each other, um, when you mentioned that you know Python is scripting, um, that's kind of been the way we've always done stuff with storage arrays and with uh, you know with with uh, um, switches and different technology. Everything has an API. Everything has an interface. You know whether it's command line or an API. And in most cases, we tend to find that um, the only the only reasonably good way to talk to all these different items is through scripting. So I think in some cases, a lot of the, you know the developer community probably looked at a few different ways to do this, and then came to the idea that well, hey, if we're gonna you know we need to be compatible and we need to talk to all these different items. Yeah, scripting is probably the way to do it. Sure, sure. And, and, uh, and uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Nope. I was just gonna say, um, it's funny that like, I, I feel like whenever you mention um, when you have to tiptoe around saying that Python is a, a scripting language, you're kind of this is a little bit off topic, but it's kind of people have very strong opinions about uh, like what a programming language is and what it should be used for, and I feel like when that gets violated, a lot of people kind of get upset. But it's uh, kind of a unique situation here because there were a lot of, of developers, like more developers than most software has users, that were able to get behind this project and, and make it pretty pretty darn successful. So uh, that, that's great. And I guess, um, not to cut off Christian if he had a question as well, but do you see any like potential flaws or drawbacks for this, this push, um, or at least grassroots push towards the OpenStack architecture? Yeah, you know the the thing that stuck in my mind that I was concerned about is um, you know hypervisor support and just industry support because if you get too many of the big guys who kind of dig in their heels and say, "Hey, I'm not going to play with that," that will squash that development or hinder it. And you know, not to jump around to too many different things, but it's like um, you know we've lived in a kind of a two to three hypervisor world for quite a while here with you know VMware always being on the leading edge of uh, server virtualization and then really Zen was leading in or in second place until Hyper-V came on so strong and now Zen has kind of really turned more into tools and then there's uh, there's several communities really trying to push and promote um, um, KVM as an open source type of product and take it on as more of a red hat, you know, we're going to sell bundles and services and things like that. And so now all of a sudden, you know, and I, I kind of jump back on some of these folks and go, okay, so pretend I'm a big IT department and explain to me why I need a fourth hypervisor. And you talk about it and it inevitably, it's not that you'll use all four, but it's surprising the number of folks that play with 
a KVM and and realize, hey, this is pretty lean. It's great performance, and you know I like the way the tools work maybe better than Hyper V. So now all of a sudden maybe there's certain tasks I I throw on that. So you know back to your question, I think that you know adoption, it can be the greatest technology in the world. But if I can't get operating systems and hypervisors and if I can't get the stack to run on it, nobody's going to use it. And so far, pleasantly surprised that the stack is uh, coming together nicely. Yeah, and uh, as, a, as a fun trivia track, fun, tri wow, fun trivia fact, this is why we don't podcast after 10. Uh, <laughs> Fun trivia fact, uh, the founder of OpenStack, Chris Kemp, um, is a Buffalo native, which makes me feel happy, and uh, more importantly, um, was the NASA's first CTO. So the origins of OpenStack actually come out of NASA, which is scary to me for several reasons, but um, <laughs> the one thing that uh, really kind of built OpenStack, it, it wasn't called that then when they first did it, it was uh, Nova. And Nova is what became the compute module of OpenStack, but that was kind of the first spin-off project that um, got things going, and he decided eventually that he was going to leave NASA to pursue that full-time. Um, but so all these kind of uh, the core modules, the compute, networking, storage, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about how those have evolved over time here, um, each one of those has uh, grown from a very tight community NASA eventually decided that they weren't really going to stay behind the Nova compute uh, module, and so they kind of open sourced it and let it go. Um, and then that's really when these other modules started to come together. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit wait, later why I feel this way, but at the end of the day, the only module that ever made sense to me in terms of like this is a relatively sophisticated piece of software that enhances my life somehow is the Neutron networking module, which really has some pretty advanced capabilities. Um, all the other ones I can kind of show you in uh, hopefully a few amount of words how unneeded that they are in terms of getting the core functionality of running a hypervisor and managing VMs. Uh, you really don't need much, but what OpenStack is doing and all the tens of thousands of lines of source code they have is basically making it a magical experience for you to manage it. It's a big management infrastructure, but it's not the hypervisor. It's not doing the low-level stuff, which is part of the reason why um, Python manages to work, even though it may seem like Python would never be able to deliver something like that. Um, no, it, ab absolutely, and I think... Uh, I'm glad you brought up the networking aspect of it because that's um, yeah, and, and this isn't limited to OpenStack, but you know, on this hypervisor type of topic, I I still see a lot of um, uh, it, the the whole Docker thing, the containerization of apps. Um, people are you know not necessarily embracing that yet, but everybody's kind of in a buzz about it because as we look at that mobility aspect to the data center, I've I've got my information here that I've created through business analytics, business intelligence. What am I going to do with it? I'm going to get it to users in the best fashion they can use it in, and the best way for me to do that is more than likely to create applications specific for that function. So yeah. the, the Docker thing looks all magical and wonderful. Wonderful until you start talking to networking guys who go, uh, wait a minute, you're telling me I'm going to have like a thousand little applications running around, moving data back and forth, and so I, I, you know, not to put too much light or pressure on it, but I think in the end that networking portion of OpenStack could be its, uh, you know, uh, silver lining, you know, the, the 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 secret blessing of this deal is the is the structure that it's built on, um, possibly more than the management tools and the open functionality there. Yeah, well, and it's funny too when we talk about the capabilities of the networking and who likes it, because from a user standpoint, it's it's pretty robust. Um, from an administrator standpoint, to actually get the implementation of the networking install done correctly is actually probably one of the hardest installs I've ever had to do. Um, five years ago, I would have told you SharePoint, because SharePoint, there's no such thing as a SharePoint installation that works correctly the first time. Um, and even when you think it works correctly, it really is never truly 100% correct. That's just not possible. Um, call your local Microsoft vendor for more details <laughs> on the features that they um, include. 
Um, but with the OpenStack networking, one of the hardest parts of actually setting that up, at least in the conventional multi-node way that OpenStack would typically be set up, is getting this multiple layers of networking bridges to work correctly um, because the the architecture basically does internal bridging to these different ports, and it's incredibly confusing if you're a first-time OpenStack administrator to figure out what direction the bridges are going. You have multiple bridges. You can set it up as tunnels, um, and there's a lot of different NAT things that have to be done and just right, or, it's, or it's something's going to break. And... Um, really one of the only ways to ensure that you debug it is to um, packet trace from each hop to hop and figure out what interface or what NAT rule is missing and then figure out why didn't OpenStack put the right configuration in there to get that route going. Um, but that's definitely one of the hardest installs I've done in recent um, and actually is still to this day probably why it attracts so many people because, um, you know, people normally blow through setting up the compute storage and, and RPMs pretty quickly. 90% um, of the work involved goes into getting that networking setup done right. And so that's actually a, uh, when you talk about the cost of open source, that's a cost for enterprise to get right is the training that's required to do that correctly. No, absolutely. It, it, it's interesting you mentioned that because as a, uh, so once again, back to the products that my company sells, we happen to not be a Cisco distributor. And of course, Cisco is the lion's share in the marketplace. Um, but we have, uh, you know, Brocade and Juniper. And if you look at the, the higher end fabric technology, the, uh, the Ethernet fabric of the VDX, which is from Brocade, or the Q fabric from Juniper, um, early on we tried to look at, hey, these are great technologies. We can, we can show you all day long how they're, you know, superior to Cisco's solutions. But uh, how do we best show this stuff off? And that's actually how my team kind of stumbled into OpenStack is we were looking for a way to demonstrate the better functionality of some of these other networking fabrics. And uh, OpenStack was a great way to show it and uh, quickly became a way for us, you know, still not simple, but um, it's one of the things we've honed in on is how a... Uh, a VDX Ethernet fabric network differs from a Cisco network in that uh, in that realm. So uh, yeah, networking is a is a huge portion of this deal. Yeah, and one of the big uh, features that OpenStack really brings to light is something we talked about back in uh, part one of the series, which is software defined networking. So um, there's a lot of different uh, capabilities within the Neutron networking module that allows you to basically define significant portions of your cloud environment as software defined. Um, and so using things like the Open vSwitch uh, software to basically have virtual switching and have your IP routers all be virtual, um, you can really build an entire virtual uh, network topology um, inside your CPUs and your data center, which is an incredibly powerful solution. Um, it's probably the, the downside to that is the management of that, but it's relatively self-sustaining. Um, but it really allows you to kind of have drag and drop capabilities. So mm -hmm. when I'm in my graphical interface for OpenStack, I can, you know, take a VM, detach it from one network, put it in a completely new network, and I didn't have to change a cable or do anything. Everything was basically virtually routed and defined to begin with. So um, I'm a big proponent of how that design is, and a lot of the top-notch data centers you see today, whether we talk about Google or so forth, um, more and more of those in production are now software-defined, um, mm -hmm. and it, they're using the same base protocol, the open uh, open vSwitch and or OpenFlow, which OpenFlow is the the protocol of how the networking communication works, which is an implementation of having a network switch that understands that protocol. But it really gives you a lot of flexibility and can drive the cost down in maintaining those physical network topologies because it's all virtualized. Yeah, I was actually like just about to ask you about software to networking, so I'm glad that you brought it up. Um, do you think that like OpenStack is uh, this is not just for Christian, but I know that Christian has some experience with it, given that he's uh, he, he did some research with it with uh, Dr. Perlow, who is all, we've also had on the show. Um, and do you think that OpenStack is kind of 
the one of the the better options for it, or is it just one of multiple? Because I've I, I feel like I've kind of heard it a lot in the context of of OpenStack, uh, but to be honest, I'm not super knowledgeable in this field, so it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on it. Yeah, I mean, it's a great place to basically do the development and research side, and because the OpenStack comes bundled with Open vSwitch, it's kind of an easy thing to get set up and going and have your first taste of what software-defined networking can be like. Um, I certainly wouldn't say that OpenStack is like the, the you know, mammoth-sized deployment of SDN where it covers all cases. There's really a lot of different types of SDN. Um, you're also seeing switches supporting this at certain levels on the hardware level uh, side as well. And a lot of the proprietary vendors, like we've talked about earlier, Cisco and so forth, are now competing with the fact that SDN is is damaging their, their proprietary revenue stream. Um, and so they've also started dabbling in the space with their own implementations in an attempt to kind of coerce the market towards certain directions that are going to benefit them financially without um, kind of dismissing the fact of what the um, OpenFlow uh, technology does. But really, um, when you get down to it, there are a lot of different implementations of the switch protocols. You can do that uh, a lot of different ways um, in both physical and virtually defined switches. I would say one of the things that OpenStack is a great uh, demo of is virtualizing that topology. Um, and, you know, we see in, in Hypervisor and a lot of these other virtualization technologies, it's very easy to do things like VLAN tagging. But, again, normally a lot of that is dependent on a physical switch. Um, and the virtual switches that you would define in, say, Hyper-V are really almost always binding directly to the uh, physical interfaces. There's normally not a layer or or tier of uh, virtual networking that get before you get to that physical bridge, uh, whereas with OpenStack, there's a lot more layers that are built in between the physical and the virtual. Um, so it's a great way to kind of get introduced and get your feet wet, um, but certainly doesn't encompass uh, a large majority of what is out there in that space. That's interesting, yeah, and it's it's interesting how the enterprise seem enterprise companies that you mentioned are kind of following. Uh, I I don't know whether who really started it, but they're they're at least you know taking this software de uh, software defined networking seriously and and providing other options as well, which I think uh, the more the better because uh, just you know the the competition is good for the the research and and development of it as a whole. Um, but I'd be interested if, if Kevin has a different perspective on it actually being in the enterprise. Uh, I plead the fifth. <laughs> the, uh, so what you're hitting on is, is you know, and I, I speak pretty openly about the political nature, and, and right now um, Christian hit on a lot of good points, is so if you think of SDN, um, everybody knows they have to play, participate, but every time you talk to a networking vendor um, they describe SDN uh, you know a software defined as somewhat differently uh, you know to some folks it's just having virtual versions of their switches to some folks it's it's more of a broader spectrum the battle right now is that VMware is promoting their solution which is NSX and their partners and Cisco doesn't happen to be one of them so it's it's a frenemy type of relationship obviously the two work together on lots of stuff but they're kind of approaching uh, SDN from uh, different segments of the of the market um, uh, and, and, and you, you, know, you guys kind of, you, you nailed it is that people are working very heavily from a lab point of view on virtualization and networking because I think they're all realizing and and one of the things we're seeing more and more and we, we probably should have started the show with kind of a recap of private cloud versus public cloud and why a lot of this stuff is happening but I, I always do the story of uh, you know if we went to tour uh, uh, my company's data center a few years ago it would be you know, hey, what, what are those? Uh, that looks like a bunch of IBM servers over there and some NetApp storage. Uh, what's running on that? Uh, oh, that's Exchange for the entire company. Okay, and, and is that virtualized? Yep, virtual machines, it's all virtualized. And over here, what are these HP servers in that EMC storage? Oh, that's uh, our Oracle implementation that does all of our uh, ERP and our financials and all of that. And, and it's, it's back to this term of silos of virtualization. 
everything in there is virtualized, but the network is not set up in a way to take advantage of these different areas. You know, and a good example for us is, you know, uh, over here was a bunch more HP servers uh, running VDI for Europe. So we're running virtual desktops for all of Europe. So for a, for a worldwide company, one of the things you think about is um, a lot of Europe still takes the majority of December off as a Christmas holiday. So those servers would literally kind of be spun down. What's the big happening in my industry in December? Year end, year end close. You know, we're, we're working that last, Chris, the week between Christmas and New Year's is one of our busiest weeks. Can we take advantage of those servers that aren't being used by the VDI sets in Europe? In our old structure, the answer was no, because we didn't have a flat network or a fabric network in there to deal with that. So this private cloud environment, if we toured a data center of ours today, it would be more of, hey, what do those servers over there do? And the answer would be, I don't know, we could go, you know, we'd have to go to a console and look up an app and find out where it is. And, you know, I see we've got different manufacturers of storage over there, which vendor does what? Well, we don't really break it out that way. Here's a definition of our tier zero storage. That's our fastest storage. Here's tier one, here's tier two, here's archive. And it's not so much hung up on who the vendor is or what the or, or you know what the technology is. It's more about the SLA and quality of service. And now app owners come in and basically say, here's what my app does and here's what I need it to do. And that that's where now when IT departments are being hit with that, it's where they're saying, hey, the only way I can get to that is to think outside the box on my networking. So, uh, you know, some of the new networking guys, actually people like Plexus up in the Northeast, they've got, their switch technology is based on kind of a whole different, you know, photonic switching capability. And their underpinnings of that are very, very SDN centric. So, it, you know, they're, they're just thinking in terms of how software defined networking would work into that equation. So a lot of folks are really pounding on that in the labs. And I would say the next generation hop they make, um, there's Cisco gets kind of badly labeled for if you need more performance, add more ports. And Cisco bases their maintenance on number of ports you have. They base lots of things on the number of ports you have. I'm really refreshed by the number of new networking vendors who are not port. Yeah, you know, they, they don't really care about ports. It's how fast a port do you need? Is it 100 gigabit Ethernet? Is it 40 gigabit? Is it 10 gigabit? Is it gigabit? And you know, where are your paths? What's your east-west traffic look like? And how do we plan for those kind of things? So, it's really this idea of let's break down those silos inside the data center. Let's stop thinking about that rack of servers does this and this rack does that. It's more about what are the performance levels we're working on in the data center. How do we make that seamless? And you know, this all kind of ties back into if you if you if we whiteboarded this all out, we'd probably step back and go, "Hey, I think OpenStack would be a pretty good solution to uh, to jump into this with." And you know, so, sometimes when we have a solution in mind, we end up architecting towards that solution. But in a lot of cases, if OpenStack fulfills on promises and continues down the path, a lot of what I just described is deliverable by OpenStack. Yeah. No, yeah, and that's a great that's a great explanation of the uh virtualization of that you know, not having virtualization silos. So thank you for that. You bet. And from a, a, a taking a step back, what's really uh fascinating too about a lot of this implementation, um not really specifically OpenStack, but more going back to SDN, the original OpenFlow specification was really described as, quote, a standard that enables researchers to run experimental protocols in the campus networks we use every day. So all the guys who came up with OpenFlow are some of the uh, top um, high-performance network compute uh, research assistants at the top universities that uh, partner with Internet2. And so I worked with some of these researchers at uh, College Park where um, Internet2 has a pretty good... Um, uh, relationship with uh, Mid-Atlantic Crossroads and um, Larry, I believe his name is Larry Peterson, maybe. Uh, I think so. We'll go with that for now. <laughs> um, he was the uh, author out of Princeton, New Jersey, that was the partner on this, and there were four or five different universities. Um, 
but he also writes the uh, computer networking textbook that College Park uses. So there's a lot of the same names um, in the uh, network education um, side of the of computer science research that put a lot of the underpinnings that made this whole thing take off. Um, so it's actually been somewhat interesting for me as a as an undergraduate researcher to see how you know some of the people I've worked with have been directly involved in making a whole industry explode like that, um, especially because sometimes these things come from, you know, the enterprise invents it, sometimes academia invents it and gets it right. Um, so it was it was interesting to see that. Kevin, do you think OpenStack is going to make it? Do you think it's um, at a point of maturity and stability that people are going to want to stay on it, or do you think it's a fad? I You know, um, I, I think it's going to make it. And, and when I say that... I, I have to believe that inevitably there there will become flavors of it, which you know I started the conversation by the end users don't want there to be different flavors of it. Um, but you know, um, Ashton, you asked what could kind of derail OpenStack. Um, one of the other things I, I neglected to mention is. Um, you know, Intel is a huge backer of Open Cloud, as they call it, but OpenStack is a big portion of that. So um, it's it's interesting how a semiconductor, a chip manufacturer of Intel's caliber, can help drive and push a lot of these things. So I I view I, I guess I view OpenStack like I I believe it's going to make it. It's getting embraced more and more, um, but I have to believe probably three to five years from now, it's probably going to look quite different than it does today. Yeah, I, uh, I. It's I okay to should, disagree. I know. I'm just saying. I think <laughs> we should make a financial bet on uh, what, whether or not it succeeds. I, I've gone back and forth. I think one of the things that has perturbed me about OpenStack has been some of the source code is terrible, um, mm -hmm. which a lot of like users who just use it may not see that and may think that they're doing something wrong when they're configuring it but it's probably that the source code is terrible. Um, and so when I was doing development on the the on my research on basically elephant flows and being able to do high-performance routes, I modified a, not a, a relatively significant portion of the source code uh, to inject the hooks I needed to add my own calls into OpenStack. And it's not fun by any means no. uh, to get that working right. So kind of the, the growth complexity of it is one thing. Um, I think they've started to implement a lot more enterprise-grade features than what uh, was available when I was using the release, which was uh, the one before Juno, which I don't remember what the name was. Um, but Juno has kind of been the, the enterprise um, hot topic for OpenStack and um, is, I think, their most recent release, unless I'm already dated on that. But um, there are kind of all these different features and again I get worried that they're trying to become the 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 one size fits all jumpsuit um, and I don't think they'll be able to sustain that model very easily um, and and there have been some major if you take a look at the the life cycle of the community and what kinda you can kinda tell whether or not a community is state uh, sustainable based on who the long-term committers are and who's been changing out and I, I'm pretty sure that Basically, Rackspace and several others have pulled out of using this in production basically because they couldn't get it to be sustainable both from a revenue standpoint and from a management standpoint where it just was like the feasibility of doing this was not um, – was coming at a loss to the company and so they, they kind of stopped. And mm -hmm. with that decision, uh, a lot of the developers kind of – you know, new names were showing up in the open source community because basically – how do you own an open source project? Simple. You inject, you flush a bunch of your developers from your company to be the all the contributors to the open source to the point where your company has a pretty good say and conversation over how it's going because you're you're paying developers in your company to basically turn around that open source product to benefit the most out of you. Um, and so there have been a couple big names that have done that with OpenStack. Rackspace was certainly the number one contributor for quite some time. I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure they're not very high on that list anymore. I don't know, so no quotes there. But um, from, a, from a general s standpoint, that type of sea change in the – you know, largest committers to me spells that they're not as stable as what some people think. Um, 
And I've read some really interesting articles on uh, Tech Republic in the last month or so that basically says, at the end of the day, what am I getting out of OpenStack from like a management perspective that I can't get with you know, my existing hypervisor and custom solutions that my enterprise has already built around this? Um, and it brings up some really, I think, valid questions as to um, where where is the real value supposed to be out of this platform, and is it a higher cost to implement than it's worth? Mm -hmm. right. Sorry about that. I had something blow up in my ear. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how sometimes a website will pop up that you didn't know was popping up, and all of a sudden there's music blasting. On. <laughs> Ashton, you have anything? That's always fun. Um. To be honest, I don't have a lot of experience with uh, to, with OpenStack. Uh, I guess Christian has it through the, the software defined researching, uh, rather software defined networking that he did for research. And uh, but I, I haven't really worked with it before, um, so I've learned a lot. But I don't I don't have a whole lot to contribute. I'm sorry. Well, in into your so. I, I'm 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 going to try and tell a humorous anecdote without using anybody's names because they would all be mad at me if I did. But uh, an an engineer who was on my team, uh, very brilliant networking uh, gentleman, uh, left the team to uh, go work on uh, OpenStack for a large company, and uh, you know he was working. He was just sharing with me one day. He was working on something, and to your point about the development and certain modules. Something just wasn't stable, wasn't working right. So he starts drilling down into you know these different things, and he's digging into one module, and he's like, you know, this this is awful. This is just terrible. You know, who who you know, it's a little bit of that you, you know thing that many of us have done at one point in time where you utter out loud, you know, what kind of an idiot did this? And of course, another guy on their team had had done that, and it was it was a little bit of the well, you know, as not my best work, and I, you know, <laughs> sorry about that. But uh, you know, that was that was his point. Was there's many times if something does not look right in OpenStack, it's probably a module that needs some attention, needs some work done on it, and and inevitably, and I, I don't mean to sound you know hypocritical here, but in some ways, um, the EMS, the the HP implementation or the vendor centric implementation, uh, you know, there's a there's a, uh, when you mentioned whether they'll make it or not, uh, very intriguing company to me. Uh, Mirantis is really embracing the OpenStack thing, but are they trying to do too many different things? They're trying to do education. They're trying to set standards. They're trying to um, you know kind of be all things. They've got good backing by a lot of people, but um, you know, once again, if the product that you're basing all this work on is not as stable as it should be, um, are you really going to make it? Are you really going to make it happen? So, um, the, you know, the and and I guess what we're looking at right now is because most people are either dabbling in it or working with it lightly in the lab area. Um, as was said earlier, I still think it's a great way for people to um, you know, learn networking from a different point of view, learn some of the ins and outs, probably a better way to pick up SDN. So I don't know that, uh, you know, I haven't heard anybody really bemoaning the fact that they wasted too much effort or wasted too much time on OpenStack. Um, I think a lot have just made the deduction of it's not ready for prime time yet from my point of view. Yeah, and you mentioned that, um, in, you know, if, if assuming it's around in three years, it'll be a totally... It, it, it's likely to be a totally different um, software, uh, and I think that might be for the best. It sounds like yeah. if uh, if the the source code really is as horrendous as a Christian makes it out to be. But to be fair, when I look at my code from a year ago, if, if uh, there should there should be an exercise where someone just shows me like some random piece of code and says tell me all the things that are wrong with this, and I'd be looking through it, and I'd be like, wow, this is really terrible. And they'd be like, that's your code from a year ago. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I kind of hope that, uh, well, in a way, I kind of hope that keeps happening for me, because then that means I'm improving. But it's not the kind of code that you would want um, to have to depend on for something as, as important as uh, networking. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, I, I did want to inject the, the title of that um, 
either I put this in there or Magic Tooth Fairy added it for me, but um, the title of that um, Tech Republic article is OpenStack Needs More Than Cheerleaders, and it's kind of a very true <laughs> statement um, because it talks about who the big adopters have been of the platform, um, and, and it kind of gets to the point that really the only thing or area where it's taking off at is Red Hat. Well, oh, that's weird because Red Hat is the whole backer of this thing. Um, and it, it really makes some very dry cut arguments about when I got things like Azure and AWS out here, how is OpenStack going to survive and what are they doing to pull that traction? So it's a good read. It's a pretty brief read. Uh, you can easily find it with that title, OpenStack Needs More Than Cheerleaders. I think it's a pretty great title and it talks about some of my personal frustrations with it. Um, but again, it, it always has a special place in my heart because it, it, it opened up a very big log jam and, a, and, and opened up a uh, an area that I think has forced the proprietary solutions to stay competitive and show why they're at a higher value add um, than, than the open source community. But it's also given a lot of um, bang for the buck, so to speak, in terms of getting um, customized solutions in the enterprise um, that, you know, might be time intensive, might require some special training to get set up right, um, but have really kind of sparked some innovation, I think, which um, when we talk about where a lot of the innovation is coming in software development and in Fortune 500, a lot of it is open source. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about that last week on um, when we were going through some of the, the trends in big data that you know a lot of these platforms open source, open source projects that are then derivative works and are customized, but that baseline is the Apache. I mean, honest to God, where the hell would we be in the last five years if the Apache Foundation didn't exist? Right. I mean, some of the biggest projects that are the most widely adopted, whether you're a home user, an enterprise user, a open source fanatic, a freedom for Linux user, um, Apache Foundation runs the show on a lot of the key technologies that are pushing the hype trend forward. So um, I like to think that OpenStack is kind of bundled into that that image for me. Well, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because the at the end of the day, OpenStack has, whether it's around, so you think about the things that we've chatted about so far, and I want to touch on storage here a little bit as well, is it's making people think about things differently. So even if OpenStack inevitably fails horribly, I think it has done a lot to cause people to look at networking differently and head down, you know, uh, SDN routes. Um, you think about storage, my life in storage over, you know, since the Arrow con, you know, created our storage division was about the time that storage arrays were coming into their own. So it was, it, it's file or block and we've lived file or block forever, whatever the connectivity was. And now object storage is really starting to, you know, we've talked about it for years, but object storage is kind of coming into its own. And I think yeah. the more we're talking about, you know, not just tied to OpenStack, but the idea of objects ties back into my obsession with containerized apps and things from that point of view. Um, today it's a small portion of the market, but we're starting to see things really heat up uh, You know, with some of the big players like uh, EMC and uh, HDS on the high end of things. So um, we're really, you know, I'd be curious what your thoughts are from an from a object storage point of view. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think it's definitely something that really came popular at first with AWS before anything else. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's where it kind of got its, its, its trendability, but it provides a level of scalability that I don't think we've seen in traditional file systems. And if anything, not just for the cloud, um, it has kind of given us a broader view of what does it mean to be a file system or a storage system? Um, and, I think it, it has expanded people's vision of saying a file system is more than a hard drive, its format, NTFS, FAT, X4, whatever your format of choice is, and your, your data. It's now kind of, well, we can represent things in its raw form as binary objects. They're highly accessible. We can index them as in certain ways, and we can basically create these. You know what the object store really reminds me of at the, at the end of the day? It's the equivalent in my mind, of what a programming heap is, right? In Java, rather than having this highly controlled stack or this place where I'm responsible for allocating and freeing the memory properly, 
um, I have this nice managed pool of memory where objects are being created and destroyed and there are references in which I can access that data and get it back to my program. It's the same thing with the object storage except now you're looking at it at a systems level where you're getting a lot of that redundancy, high performance throughput, um, you're, you're, you're taking another axe. That I always talk about swinging an axe at raid cards because they, they need to die and they need to die fast. Um, this swings another axe at that. Um, and then the equivalent kind of, well, it's not the equivalent. This one's different. But the block storage gets to my earlier point of it's, it's the raw kind of, I call it the boonga boonga of cloud storage, which is you're, you're, you're in the forest and you're getting the essentials of the storage and it's giving you raw blocks that are really mobile because you can just take them out from one system, put them into another, and it gives you a lot of that flexibility to get direct I.O. access no matter where you are in the cloud. Um, but I call it the Boonga Boonga because it doesn't have that high level abstraction of objects that you get with the, um, the object storage scenario. But I think these are two prime examples. OpenStack does a really nice job at implementing these um, for like block storage. When I think block storage, I think archival backup immediately. Um, that's a great solution for if I want to have that titanium backup solution where I'm just dumping images of cloud uh, virtual machines in a place where I know I can get backups back. That's a great example of where I would be using um, block storage. And object storage honestly has a lot more, I think, uh, flex flexibility in working with um, programs, right? I mean, it can store the virtual machine images, but I think it also has the really high potential value to be much more interoperable with uh, programs that have uh, relatively nicely defined um, APIs. And so I think that's a place where you'll continue to see that type of storage expand. And I think these are two storage options in a virtualized environment that you're going to see staying around for quite a while. Um, they seem to be very popular models across the, um, across the life cycle, and, and that I, I, I appreciate. Um, question out in chat that I really do want to address because I want to be clear um, why no RAID cards in a cloud environment where you know you're talking thousands tens of thousands of machines some of them are virtual some of them are not it becomes a real pain to buy and invest in RAID cards which uh, you know five years from now when your data center is still running and you may be phasing things in and out if that RAID card fails chances are either one, that RAID card isn't on the mar in the market anymore and you didn't buy a replacement for it when you stocked inventory. But more importantly, why do I want to have to mess around with a custom BIOS, a custom firmware, picking a RAID type, and doing all these things just to make my disks run fast and in parallel when I can get the same level of performance by basically saying, stick them all in JBOD and then use these more... Uh, complex program layers to get the same level of performance. And so I really think that over time, the value add that RAID has provided us for years um, will start to go down. And so I'm not saying RAID is going to start suddenly phase out of your high performance desktop rig anytime soon, but in these big cloud data center environments, I think RAID is starting to lose its place. And, and we've had this conversation in work a lot where it's like we had a RAID controller fail the RAID controller is supposed to, uh, well, no, I misspoke. We had a, a, a RAID system fail, and we said, well, okay, the whole point of RAID is that we're supposed to be able to restore this thing, right? <laughs> well, guess what? That didn't work either. So it's like even even the, the, the glitchiness and the probability that RAID always works the way it's supposed to is, is very, it's a little bit nerve-wracking in some environments. Um, and when we did a performance comparison of the physical hardware RAID in one of our solutions to using the native built-in RAID 6 software solution that Unix now provides out of its kernel, it's not that really big of a performance difference. They were pretty, pretty damn close. Mm -hmm. And it's a one-click button and setup that I know all my Unix environment is going to understand no matter where I take that system, um, whereas... Whereas, you know, in, in the other case, that's not going to be as effective. And yeah, SSDs are really dating the, you know, multi-RAID drives to get a high-performance gaming rig, which, again, is 
everyone is continuing to support my argument for the death of RAID, so I love it. Um, but you really don't see SSDs in RAID that much because of the bus saturation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've kind of, I think we've gotten to a point where the, the day of the RAID card is, is coming to a close, but I think it's going to take another five years before you really start to see a good dent in that happening. Maybe you need to have a financial bet on that as well, Christian. Yeah, I guess so. I guess I got two bets open for tonight. Yeah, two, two open bets. I'll have to write those down and come back to them years yeah. later. And and, uh, and and I don't disagree with you, and that's going to surprise some people. As I, If you spend any time on the forums, I advocate uh, raid cards uh, constantly. But um, you, people need to look at the, the – and you hit on all the major points there. I almost feel like um, we have to break out raid cards versus raid. Because I yeah. think I think raid will hang on right, right, right. for a period of time, but you're spot on with raid cards. So if you go read my posts in the forum for the home users, I'm advocating HP raid cards, which are you know very very um, reliable, very well rounded, very compatible with each other. But I'm also advocating buying used ones that are cheap. If I was shelling out, you know, buy your micro server for three hundred dollars and buy your uh, your uh, raid your p430 raid card for five hundred dollars it, it'd be a little tough to swallow buying a used raid card for a hundred bucks is is pretty easy but we're also hitting into a point in time where if you do the dynamics behind raid cards um five terabyte drives just the just you know uh, just the test time for a five terabyte drive regardless of how you're dealing with it um if you look about you know if you look at some of the bigger um uh, storage arrays out there, so like the big EMC and NetApp arrays we sell, they're they're RAID based internally. They, but what a lot of people don't realize is technically it's software RAID. There's there's no RAID controllers in those boxes. If you pull one apart, the controllers look like Xeon servers. You know, it's it's uh, two or four Xeon processors in a chipset, and uh, they're doing all their drive scrubbing and all their RAID and all their other functionality through software. And uh, your traditional RAID 6s and uh, RAID, uh, you know, RAID 5, RAID 6, all these different functions, um, ultimately I think you're going to see things like, uh, you know, storage spaces is a bad name right now, but uh, I, Jim has said it before, Microsoft is behind making that work. Um, there's a technology out of, I think, uh, one of the California colleges called Crush, which is a pretty interesting um, function. But the thing that makes a lot of these different RAID functions work is um, uh, lots of drives. You know, you look at uh, a few years ago, uh, a company called XIV brought out a new storage product. The smallest unit of it was 150 drives. So, you know, these are these are concepts that I think some cases to get by these things, we're going to have to look at things from a different point of view. Cascading this down to that that small server user, mirroring is an easy way to do these things, and mirroring is a safe way to do these things. So as much as people hate to hear the idea of, yes, I bought two 8-terabyte drives, and I have 8-terabyte of usable space, that's probably the safest thing for you to work off from from a home user you know, kind of point of view. Yeah. Now, um, it's, it's good that, well... It's good that you provide the contrast of the value, the low value raid cards, and doing that setup because that's something that I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't shoot from my hip from, but, but um, I don't do that stuff as much. So, well, and in, in, no, but, but to your point, I think that's, um, you, you know, the, the, the thing I grimace about is when people get kind of bent out of shape about making sure that their, um, their, you know, stuff is backed up but they're out there trying to buy the cheapest raid card they can find, you know, and, and if you're going to depend on this, and it's one of the things we harp on pretty heavily, whether it's home server, personal use, or in the data center, raid is not a backup, you know, raid, raid is a level of redundancy or it's a level of tolerance, but it's not any kind of a backup. So it doesn't preclude you. And I think that's with some of this object-based storage. The idea is now all of a sudden I have pools of data and I have redundancy in those pools. And, you know, it's things are just getting much smarter about um, – and, and back to your point from a few minutes ago, 
when we thought about things from a NAS or a file point of view, we had to make sure those files were in multiple places. And block storage was always tough because we would have to do things like quiescing a database before we took a snapshot of it. And the big breakthrough in block was the ability to do point-in-time copy snapshots and do mirroring and those types of things. And that was pretty elaborate technology to have the storage array talk to the server and the application and quiesce the data, freeze it, take a snapshot, you know, all these different steps to make sure you had a good copy of it that when you think about object storage, a lot of that goes away. A lot of it is simplified from the point of view of saying um, uh, of by design there are functions built in to make those objects stop or stall or, or you know, um, you know it, it, the snapshot is a good analogy for it because the point of view is... Um, you know, if you take a picture of a moving car, it's going to be blurry. You got to wait till something's standing still to take that point in time copy and snapshot. So, yeah. um, I, I just think it opens us up to a lot of different, um, you know, opportunities and functions. Agreed. All right. Is that? Uh, do we get it all in three sessions? Have I we, think we. I think we did it. <laughs> I think I think we're as close as we're gonna get. Yeah. All right. Well, Kevin, I I do want to say thank you for giving thank us you. three hours of your life. Uh, <laughs> come on here over the last month, and I know it's a passion of yours, so I know you're always willing to do that. But thanks for taking some time to to be on with us. It's it's like Gilligan's Island. It's a three hour tour. <laughs> it is a. It's definitely. They did not have as much fun as we did though on their <laughs> three hour tour. So. Uh, good. Uh, Christian, Ashton, anything else you guys want to add in before I wrap it? I think we did a pretty solid job. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm good if you're good. <laughs> you're good. You're good. Yeah, we. this is the advantage of doing these a little bit later. <laughs> Everybody gets tired and they're like, I don't really want to talk anymore. And we're done. And uh, <laughs> okay. I will say this, though. Uh, right now, Maryland UCLA is starting in the, in the uh, regionals in uh, Southern California, I think is where they're at. So Christian, uh, winner goes to the Super Regionals for uh, the, the College World Series. We are tracking that, uh, the, the interns this summer. We have a big wall of, uh, of, of brackets, and we're tracking that to see who's going to win. They, can, they get a chance to win a lunch with me. So it's a, it's a, it'll, be, it'll be a good lunch, too. It'll be a good lunch out. So Maryland UCLA starts right now. I thought you guys would care that your baseball team is in the regionals. Maybe not. That's an easy. That's an easy pick for me because uh, for for various reasons, I've always been. Uh, I've I've obviously am yeah, a Terrapins fan, and I've always hated UCLA because uh, my dad went to USC, and they were like crosstown rivals. So e a very easy pick for me. All right. Well, we'll take. Well, we want to see Maryland move on. It'd be great if they'd make it all the way to the College World Series, and you guys can uh, maybe sneak into a game over there and uh, you know break away from the, the shackles, the ruthless shackles that we keep you on. You know, Riot tight, more characters. Uh, we just drive you guys to that. But uh, we want to thank everyone listening tonight, and uh, or if you're listening to the recorded version, thanks for getting through these. Again, if you got to the end of this, and this is 22, and we have 20, 21, and 22 as a series, go back, theaverageguy.tv, and uh, you can see Cyber Frontiers. Check that section. You can go back and listen to them. We always encourage you to subscribe to this. You can do that on iTunes or any other podcatcher. If you have a problem doing that and you don't know how to do it, contact me, Jim, at theaverageguy.tv. I'll help you get through that. Sometimes on Android, that's a little more difficult than it should be. But we'd love to get you subscribed. If you're using Amazon, we want to uh, just ask you to use our Amazon affiliate link, theaverageguy.tv slash Amazon. That goes into a tech scholarship fund, and uh, we're able to purchase things for folks if they want to try them and review them for the site. And, of course, if you want to subscribe, uh, like I mentioned, we have a link to do that, theaverageguy.tv slash subscribe. We'll get all that there. I'm, I'm wearing the Media Fire t-shirt tonight, and we want to thank them for sponsoring uh, the video stuff. Christian said he'd do it, but... I wanted to give Media Media Fire a try, and of course they are hosting all our video, large and video small. If you didn't know we had those, and you've only been listening to the audio, you can see all our handsome faces, uh, and it, uh, it's always a great experience. So you can get those available. Again, that's all out at theaverageguy.tv/slash/subscribe. And uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to share it. We'd love to grow the audience. In that, we think we've got some good stuff going on here. So share it with your social networks. Drop it on Facebook. Drop it out on Twitter. Head out to Clamor. Make a Clamor. 
Christian doesn't even know what that is. Nope. Make a clamor. I'll have to I'll have to school you on that. Make a clamor and share it with your friends on Clamor. It's only it's iOS only. That's probably why you don't know about that. And we'll be back. I don't know. A couple weeks. Uh, Christian Ashton will bring you guys back. We'll give Kevin some time off, and uh, we'll have another. Do you have any idea, Christian? When what what, what we'll do next? It's going to be a surprise, but it should be something different. All right, we'll talk about that uh, off air and get that scheduled. If you ever want to know what's going on with Cyber Frontiers, head out to theaverageguy.tv. Look in the right hand column. There's a scheduling widget there, and I try to keep all the shows that are coming up on the network available there as well. So we'll do it again next time. Thanks for listening. And with that, I'll say good night, everybody. Good night. Have a good one, guys.